Hello, uh, my name is Stephen Ross. I'm a General Manager of Products and Marketing with Nikon, and we're going to continue on um, uh, in the microscopy courses with uh, a run through of the research microscope. And what I want to talk about is all of the components of the microscope and sort of how we integrate it and how you can take advantage of the components on the microscope and the aperture planes and image planes that we've discussed in previous lectures uh, to implement different techniques or applications on the microscope, such as things like building an optical trap, building a single molecule total internal reflection system, or even a confocal system. So. We're going to start with the transmitted light path on the microscope. Um, the first component of the transmitted light path that we're going to talk about is the lamp house, which is a halogen lamp house on this microscope. And that is removed with one screw here. Okay. So this is your halogen lamp house on the microscope. And you can see there's a collector lens in here. And there's actually, you can see a magnified image of the first aperture plane, which is the filament inside that halogen bulb. If we were going to actually take that bulb out of here, we would do that uh, by removing this insulated cover, which is actually very heavily shielded um, because the bulbs, uh, if they have oil on them or overheat, can actually explode. It's extremely rare, but it happens. But for that, we need to have everything shielded with uh, heavy metal inside uh, the cover of the lamp house. And then below that cover, we have this component here. And you can see that this component basically has um, the halogen bulb held by two metal clips and powered. When you install this bulb in the microscope, you'd want to actually hold it in the plastic bag it comes in, rip off the bottom of the bag, and then hold down the two clips and put the bulb in and then pull the bag off. You'll never want to get the, the oil on your fingers on that bulb. Uh, that could cause the bulb to fail. Um, behind the bulb, you see the collector lens that I spoke about before, which is magnifying the image of that filament. Again, that is your first aperture plane in the microscope in the transmitted light system. So next, transmitted light comes through here. This is all aperture space. There's nothing uh, in focus in there, and that's why we put our filters in this location. We've got several filters and a diffuser in this microscope. Anytime you have a halogen bulb or a bulb with a filament, we normally want to soften the edges of that sharp filament. We use what's called a diffuser. And this diffuser is just a frosted piece of uh, glass or plastic. And it breaks down those harsh edges of the filament in the bulb uh, and softens it. We also use a technique called a fly eye lens that instead of having a single filament, will make thousands of images of that filament uh, doing the same thing, basically diffusing it throughout the field of view and giving you very even illumination. Then we have several filter holders. There's an auxiliary holder that holds a neutral density filter. Uh, we also can use this to hold an infrared cut filter for our dynamic focusing system, the perfect focus, which we'll talk about later. Um, and then on this side of the microscope, we have two other filters. This one is called an NCB11 neutral color balancing filter. It actually looks blue when you look through it. And what that does is it actually takes the halogen bulb when it runs at low voltage is more reddish, more orangish in color. And the neutral color balancing filter actually will give you a white background as if you're running the bulb at higher voltage when it puts out more white light. And then we have a green interference filter, which is a narrow band green filter that um, is used for contrasting techniques like uh, differential interference contrast or phase contrast to give you sharper, uh, sharper images, sharper resolution in those contrasting techniques by narrowing the band of wavelengths that you're using to, uh, uh, to illuminate your specimen. So we come through here, we then have a lens here, which is called your field lens. That's actually in the first field plane of the microscope. Um, and you have an aperture here called the field aperture. Now that's the aperture that we would close when we're doing color illumination of the microscope. And it's controlled right here. All right. 
guess I should really call it a, a field iris since I uh, don't want to confuse the aperture planes and image planes. So the field iris being here on the microscope. Okay. Below that, we have the condensing system of the transmitted light path. And we'll start with this polarizer here, which is held on with one uh, screw here. And this is actually a polarizer that can go in or out of the light path. And you can see the polarizer here. Um, and uh, this is actually also the compensator of our differential interference contrast system. Um, when you have a differential interference contrast, there's many different ways that you can adjust or compensate for the, the contrast. Uh, we use what's called the decenimont compensation, and uh, in that case, we would have a quarter wave plate and polarizer, which is actually sandwiched here in this device, and you can rotate the uh, polarizer relative to the quarter wave plate, and that's going to then allow you to adjust the shadowing or contrast of the differential interference system and change also the directionality of it. Um, this mount here can be used for other techniques. Um, many people will use this mount to do things like mount quadrant photodiodes for optical trapping or second detector systems. Uh, you can utilize these mounts for those types of applications. Um, let me also, uh, now go down a little bit further, and let me get the covers off the side of the microscope so I can open up the, uh, the wires, uh, get the wires disconnected. Okay. So we just have a couple of shields that are covering the wiring in the microscope. One on that side, and... one on this side. Um, those are going into the hub controller of the microscope, which we'll talk about later. So now the condensing system, the condenser itself, which we call a universal condenser, comes off with a single screw. Let me remove that now and go through that. So this is what we call a universal condenser. Um, you can see it's basically a turret. I will it's got a condensing lens on it. In this case, it's a long working distance, LWD, 0.52 numerical aperture condensing lens. And we can put multiple condenser lenses on this, um, always trading off working distance versus resolution. So if we have 0.52 numerical aperture, it's going to significantly limit the resolution in transmitted light that you can get. Um, with, for example, a 1.4 NA oil immersion lens. Um, that's why we make uh, several different compromises. We make condensing lenses that are high NA oil uh, that actually have a numerical aperture up to about 1.4. Uh, we make a 0.85 dry. And basically all of these different options will trade off the working distance versus the resolution. Uh, this one gives you many inches of working distance, so you can manipulate the specimen, put large specimens on the, uh, on the uh, microscope. Okay. So now that we've removed the condensing lens, you can see in here that there's a number of different uh, uh, spots here, and we have prisms as well as phase rings in this condensing system. And this is where you would hold all of your modules for differential interference contrast or phase contrast. Um, you can also see that there is another iris in here, and this is an aperture iris. This is the first aperture iris in the uh, microscope. And that's going to actually adjust the cone of illumination and uh, trade off contrast for resolution in transmitted light techniques. Okay. So now we're, uh, we've, we've uh, removed many of the components on the transmitted light arm. One of the last components here is the condenser mount and condenser focus unit. And that just loosens and slides off on the dovetail here. And it's basically a solid uh, a brass adjustable mount and it has a focus on it. And then as I had mentioned, this will allow you to mount uh, additional um, 
components for doing uh, techniques. Uh, so it just gives you a focusability and it's got a uh, center, it's centered on the optical axis of the microscope. Okay, so we're getting down here. The next thing I want to remove is actually the stage on the microscope. Um, and we can do that by removing the four bolts that hold the stage. There's one here. Okay, another one here. And then two in the rear. Just make sure I don't have too many wires hanging out, and we'll lift the stage off. Okay. So the stage is actually a fairly heavy and rigid component. Um, basically, the stage is is, is somewhat simple um, in that it just has lead screws that move the stage in X and in Y. And in this case, it's got encoders, uh, linear encoders, that uh, measure very precisely the distance in X and Y the stage moves and reports back uh, to the software the exact position. Uh, this stage is also equipped with a piezo device. So this is a piezoelectric device that gives you 200 microns of uh, Z motion uh, that can be very fast, very precise, and synchronized for Things like confocal imaging, where you want to do extremely fast Z-series and move in Z uh, very repeatably, uh, uh, very accurately, as well as uh, very quickly. Okay. So now we're really getting down to sort of the base of the microscope. Um, I'm going to take off next the... Uh, the eyepiece is the microscope, and then we'll get back to the light path through. Um, this is what we would call the head of the microscope, and basically, it's a beam. It's a um, set of prisms that splits light to the eyepieces, so you could look in the microscope. And there's really nothing too special about it, um, other than it's got a what's called a Bertrand lens that can be in an open position or a Bertrand position. And what that's going to do is allow you to look in the eyepieces and switch between, in the Bertrand position, the aperture planes of the microscope. So if you wanted to see the phase rings in the microscope or to check the alignment or adjustment of differential interference contrast, you would be able to do that by looking in the Bertrand position, or you can keep it in the open position. All uh, objectives um, generally have different locations of the back aperture, so you do have a focus in the Bertrand position so that you can focus at that back aperture plane. And it's got a simple shutter to open and close the uh, light to the eyepieces. Um, next, I want to talk about the eyepiece itself. So this is a uh, fairly standard eyepiece. It's got a 22 millimeter field of view. And I just wanted to show a couple of things about the eyepiece. Okay. The eyepieces are independently focusable. So what you'd want to do when you sit down at the microscope is close one eye. You adjust the focus on the microscope to a specimen so that it looks sharp. You close one eye, adjust the focus of the eyepiece to the eye that's open, then close the other eye and adjust the other eyepiece. And this way you're going to be able to look in the binoculars of the eyepiece and have it adjusted for your eyes. These are what we call high point, high um, eye point uh, eyepieces and they allow you to use uh, the microscope without having to take off glasses. So the microscope is designed uh, to be used by people with or without glasses and is adjustable, uh, focusable for uh, individuals uh, different eyesight. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you is a area that actually has an accessible field plane inside the uh, eyepiece. And you can see I just unscrewed this little ring and there's a little shelf inside this eyepiece. And that shelf is where we would put what's called an eyepiece reticle, which is basically a small scale bar that's printed on a piece of glass that we would be able to put onto the uh, eyepiece of the uh, microscope. 
it's a nice accessible image plane um, in the microscope and it's a good location if you wanted for example to block uh, certain wavelengths of light um, there's other areas we're going to talk about or if you wanted to um, you know put an IR cut filter if you're doing something like optical trapping and you want to be very careful for laser safety there's this accessible shelf in there so you put the 25 millimeter uh, glass in there and you can screw that back in place and it'll hold uh, a piece of glass in that spot. So next we have what's called the base unit of the microscope and that base unit is here and this actually is all aperture space in the microscope. Um, some people take advantage of this and place uh, filters for safety or for um, emission in the microscope and we'll remove this part with four bolts that are here So this is basically a, a large piece of alloy cast and nothing really too special about this one, but we also make ones that have accessible aperture plane in here where we can put external phase rings or uh, different components that are in an aperture plane in a turret. We also make some that have a, a slider that allow you to just have a simple slider to put filters or rings uh, within the aperture plane which is defined right in the center here. Um, below here, this is a, a relay lens in the microscope where the light will come up through to the eyepieces and this is also a wonderful place if you wanted to put something like an IR cut filter for optical trapping again or uh, any sort of a uh, cut filter for laser safety as well as many fluorescence strategies will have a multi-band mirror to reflect fluorescence up to the specimen and then have a wheel that will switch channels to get multiple images uh, sequentially on a detector. Uh, the problem with those strategies is that you have no barrier filter to the eyepieces. So you could put a multiband barrier filter here and use one of these uh, uh, fluorescent strategies with a mu an emission filter wheel and then just have that multiband barrier so you can look in the eyepieces and see um, the specimen uh, in the, the uh, true, true ex emission color. Okay. So now we're down to, you can see the alloy cast of the main body here. Uh, next thing I'm going to do just to get it out of the way is remove the transmitted light arm. We've already gone through all the components of it. four bolts here. Okay, and that should lift up. Okay, so we'll take the transmitted light arm off the microscope lay that over here. Okay, so now we're really sort of down to the, the base of this microscope. Here we have what's called the nose piece of the microscope, uh, also known as the objective turret. Um, the nose piece has a motor in the center, and you can see it holds multiple objective lenses. Currently it's got one 100x turf lens. Uh, put that off to the side and then we will remove this component and I just want to point out a couple of things because this is not a uh, simple nose piece it's actually incorporating our perfect focus or dynamic focusing system um, there are several different types of systems like this 
Um, they work on similar principles, basically tracking the cover slip of the microscope. Just remove the, uh, loosen up this illuminator so I can get the wire out of the way. Disconnect there, and this is our nose piece and dynamic focusing system. So you can see here that uh, there's a cube that goes in and out of place. When this cube is in place, it actually has um, quite a bit of optics in this side of the unit. It has a laser diode that sends microwatts of infrared light up to the specimen and locks on to the interface of the cover slip and oil or, uh, I mean, the cover slip and water interface in an oil immersion lens or the cover slip and air interface in a dry lens and reflects back into this system off of that mirror I just showed you and goes to a linear CCD array that actually knows whether the scope is in focus, whether it's drifting below uh, due to gravity or whether it's drifting upwards due to expansion of the uh, thermal expansion of the materials and it tracks that and it does it every five milliseconds so it's imperceptible to the user but it'll hold focus indefinitely. And basically that's uh, all there is really to this component. Uh, it's got uh, slots here for your prisms for differential interference contrast. Okay, so now we're really getting down to the base of this microscope. Since I've loosened it all up, uh, let me uh, pull off and go through the uh, fluorescence or epi illumination on the microscope. We first disconnect our light source. We'll go through that in a little more detail. And here is the epi illuminator, which in this case has two motors. pull that off of the microscope. Okay, so this is our epi illuminator on the microscope. And this illuminator is actually a sort of dual purpose epi illuminator. It's got laser illumination on one side, um, and it would have a laser fiber that would connect, a uh, optical fiber that could connect to this FC coupler. And what that does is does techniques like total internal reflection fluorescence or oblique laser illumination. Um, we also utilize this for our localization super resolution uh, storm technique and that's this little hatch here actually allows you to drop in a magnifier so that you can magnify the laser beam to give you one-fourth of the field of illumination but at four times, uh, uh, I mean, yeah, one, one half the diameter at four times the intensity. So one-fourth the field of illumination at four times the intensity. The fiber tip here, again going back to aperture and image planes, is actually sitting right at an aperture plane. And we know that in the case of total internal reflection fluorescence, you need to get a collimated beam of laser light out of the objective. And we do that by taking this aperture plane, where that fiber tip is, and then relaying the core of that fiber tip to the back aperture of the, lens, of the objective lens. And we focus that with this switch here so that we're focused and then when we translate that fiber in X and Y it moves that focused laser beam in X or Y at the back aperture and that changes the angle that the light comes out in image space because uh, lateral uh, translation in uh, aperture space relates to an angular translation in image space as we've uh, talked about in previous lectures. There's an optical merge system here. There's a mirror here and then a motorized mirror here and standard wide field epifluorescence through the other side. And you can see here on both sides, we've got multiple neutral density filters uh, on both sides as well as an aperture diaphragm on the epifluorescence side. The aperture diaphragm in the case of epifluorescence 
won't actually change the resolution of the system, but will act more like a neutral density filter and attenuate light, allow you to decrease the amount of light to the specimen. In the case of fluorescence, the molecules within the specimen are actually your um, source of light. So you're not basically getting an image based on diffraction, but detecting the fluorescence that's being emitted from your specimen. So that's the epiillumination on the microscope. Okay, so now we're really getting down to the uh, base of the microscope. Um, next component we'll go through is when you have that epi light that comes into the microscope, there's actually a field aperture. And I'm going to turn the microscope around the back so that you could really take advantage of this. This is what we call the field iris. And that iris opens and closes and sits in the microscope in this position with the illuminator in place. However, if I wanted to focus something at the specimen of the microscope, knowing that that's a conjugate field plane, I know that if I can focus my light at this conjugate field plane, I will be focused at the conjugate field plane where your specimen is sitting. Okay. So by taking out the epi illuminator, putting this back in, I can use this as a target and if I set up lasers or optics on a bench and I put a lens here and I focus to that plane, I can get a spot of laser light at the specimen. And why is that useful? Well, if I wanted to do something like FRAP, all I need to do is get the appropriate wavelength of light and focus at the specimen plane. If I wanted to do optical trapping, I would do the same thing with a um, infrared laser. And uh, if I wanted to make a confocal, and I focused at this, I'd have a spot of laser light, and then I could put a confocal or parfocal detector at the uh, image plane on the side of the microscope, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and detect the photons point by point as I move a stage, so a simple stage scanning confocal microscope. Okay, so it's very useful to have these accessible planes in the microscope and know how to take advantage of them for these types of techniques. So that's our field iris. Uh, this is what we call the HUD controller on the microscope, and basically it's the brains of the microscope. It takes all of the components in the microscope that are motorized and synchronizes them and controls them. And what we would do normally is, with our software, send a recipe for an experiment, say, you know, um, take one channel image, move a filter, take another channel image, move another filter, and so on, uh, opening and closing shutters for transmitted light, epifluorescence light. And we can send all that information to onboard memory storage within this hub controller. And the hub controller then runs all the electronics on the microscope uh, locally, rather than communicating back and forth with the computer saying, open a shutter. Okay, the shutter's open, and that would normally, that type of communication could take a long time. By doing it all locally, we can actually achieve much higher speeds on the microscope to do different imaging sequences. So we'll place this here. Okay. So now, we're basically down to a block of uh, alloy with one last uh, component, or two last components, if we consider the imaging port. So let's just take this off here. And this component is called the epifluorescence turret. And the epifluorescence turret on the microscope basically just holds those uh, fluorescence filter cubes that we've talked about, which will have a dichromatic mirror, and excitation filters, and barrier filters, depending on the type of uh, uh, fluorescence filter we're using. The turret, if you see from the bottom, basically is a ball bearing turret with a motor in the middle and can switch the different fluorescence channels here. You can see some filters that are still in place. And it's got a 
a simple hard shutter. If you want to just take a quick look at your specimen, but you don't want to bleach it too much, you can just pop that closed uh, very quickly with your finger. Um, and it's got encoders in it that know what position is in place and reporting back to the software for your metadata. So now we're really down to the base of the microscope. It's just a little light shield there. And here we have what's called the tube lens of the microscope. And uh, one thing I want to show you, you can see this microscope actually has two different tube lenses in it. And I don't know if you can see that very clearly, but we're changing the tube lens in the microscope. In an infinity optical system, the magnification that the microscope achieves is due to is a, a function of the focal length of that tube lens. So what we do is we have two tube lenses, one at 200 millimeters, which is 1x magnification, one at 300 millimeters, which is 1.5x magnification. And by switching those tube lenses, we can achieve higher magnifications without having to add more glass to the system. Okay, um, the last component that I'm going to talk about is a relatively simple but very important one, and that is the imaging port on the microscope. Now everything we do is uh, for efficiency, that's why we use the tube lens method rather than adding a, a lens to magnify. And we have what's called the side port on the microscope, and then in here you basically just have a turret of prisms that'll port the emission light from uh, the specimen out to a cameras on either side or on the bottom of the microscope, or up to the eyepieces. And your cameras or detectors would be on this component here called an ISO C mount. And ISO, standing for the International Standards Organization, sets the specifications of this uh, component. And that's to enable companies, like all the camera companies, to know exactly where to put the sensor in their cameras. So this is an international standard, and from this flat shelf here to the detector is 17.526 millimeters. And that's actually important if you wanted to do something like build your own stage scanning confocal, because you know now that if you put a detector at 17.526 millimeters from that flat surface, it's going to be in focus on the microscope. Similarly, if you're going to get a spot of laser light exciting the specimen and you put a pinhole that was parfocal or confocal with that spot of laser light and a detector behind that, you can make a simple stage scanning confocal. Okay. So the last thing uh, to go through here now is just the fluorescence light source. And basically, this is uh, much more common now than high-intensity lamps. Uh, there are uh, similar light sources to the lamp house that we showed for the uh, transmitted light. But most fluorescent systems now are using light sources that are remote from the microscope, gets the heat away from the microscope. Um, this one is a metal halide system. We'll show you the bulb. And all the uh, light goes in through what's called a liquid light guide. So the light coming into this aperture is actually trapped through total internal reflection in a core filled with liquid. I uh, believe in this case it's water that would uh, keep the light uh, based on total internal reflection within that core of water into this collimating lens, which is matched to the optics in the microscope and puts a large collimated beam of light into the, uh, the microscope uh, for epifluorescence illumination. And inside here, we actually have uh, the bulb, just like with the halogen lamp house, very heavily insulated. Okay, and uh, beyond that, we have a bulb that you can pull out. Again, you'd never want to touch any of these bulbs with your fingers, but you can see this bulb actually has a uh, parabolic reflector around it, and it's a uh, metal halide uh, bulb in this case. Uh, we can use LED sources, metal halide, xenon, uh, mercury, and so on. Uh, this one again happens to be metal halide. So that's a uh, uh, remote light source and um, I think that concludes uh, basically all the components on the microscope and I thank you very much for your attention.